All right, everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Erica. I am the Communications and Outreach Manager for the Mystic River Watershed Association. And I'm joined by my colleague, Marion Miller, our educator, and I will let her introduce herself in just a moment. But quickly before we begin, I just wanted to um, introduce you to Zoom if you are new to the platform. Um, there is a chat box on your right. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to type that in and um, I will get back to you as soon as I can. I will be on the webinar the entire time. Um, additionally, if you uh, have any questions after the webinar, feel free to um, email us or message us on Facebook. Uh, because this is a webinar, um, rather than a Zoom meeting, you do not have microphone or video access. So you might be wondering if something's wrong, but that's actually um, how this format is set up. So you'll just be able to see our screens for the time being. So just to make sure you see the chat function, how about uh, everyone that's on, type in the city or town that you are watching from today. Here in Medford. Awesome, Belmont. Great. Cool. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again. I'm going to pass it over to Marion. Enjoy. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm glad you're joining me today. My name is Marion Miller. Um, I'm the Education Program Manager for Mystic River Watershed Association. Uh, normally, I'm not in my home office talking to people about things that are happening outside, but I'm happy to be here today with all of you to talk about our river herring migration, but specifically what life that big migration brings. It's an invisible and often unseen amazing wildlife event right here for us on the Mystic, but as I notice people are in other places. Uh, the herring migration happens every spring um, on rivers that end in the ocean all along the eastern seaboard. So um, it's not unique to us, but we think ours is unique in a lot of ways, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about today. So I want to share this information with you. I want you to see how interconnected our ecosystem is. Um, every time I take a dive into this connections idea, I learn new things. So I have a couple of new things I'm gonna share with you today, things I didn't know um, last year, but I know about this year. Um, and I hope that you will think about um, watching for relationships between organisms um, sort of throughout your ecosystem, your neighborhood, even if you're not along a river. Take a look and see because nature is incredibly connected and I think we as people, we tend not to think that. So let me see how this is going to go. I'm going to talk a little bit right now. I've got a few things I'm going to try to show you on screen. I hope this works. Um, and then I'm going to tell you the story of the river herring on the Mystic River. And then um, I'll invite you to help us count river herring and we'll have time for questions at the end, I hope. So if you have questions, type them into the chat box. I think Erica's gonna sort of wrangle that for me so that I can just do the presentation and at the end we'll pull out some um, questions to answer, maybe. And if you don't have questions, oh my gosh, that's awesome. It means I did a great job perhaps, or maybe I didn't do a good job because you don't have a question to ask. All right, so the other day I went to the Mystic Lakes in Medford um, which is the site of sort of the river herring, oh, maybe I'll call it the epicenter of our river herring project. So I went to scoop up some water from the lake. So this is water I scooped from the lower Mystic Lake. And when I held it up before we got started, I thought maybe it was possible to see some really small things moving around in there. So there's life everywhere. This is just lake 
water from the lower Mystic Lake teeming with tiny, tiny things. And that's part of the important story of the river herring because as this is titled, everything eats something. So we have an amazing migration of river herring on the Mystic River. Last year, there was short, we estimated, short of 800,000 fish in, that, in the system coming through the Mystic Lakes. And I'll tell you how we know that in a, in a little bit. So that's a lot of fish. So a lot of fish are coming there to lay eggs. Each female fish is estimated to lay between 60 and 300,000 eggs. Uh, that's a really wide range. Um, and it's also a whole bunch of eggs if you consider how many fish are coming through. Um, so both male and female fish are coming through. The females obviously are laying the eggs, the male fertilizing them. So if you think about almost 800,000 fish, say half are female or more, I don't know. Um, that's a lot, a lot of eggs. So there's a lot of energy in the system that the river herring are bringing, but they also are there to eat too. They've got to have some food. So when the river herring start their migration from the ocean to fresh water, because they can only lay eggs in fresh water, um, they're a about, they're not a huge fish, they're about, what, 12 inches long, basically. And we, there are two types of river herring. We lump them both together. There are alewife. If you live here in our area, you know that alewife tea station um, is named after river herring. And there's also alewife brook, which is in our watershed, also named because the fish are there in the spring or historically have been there in the spring in huge numbers. Um, so there's been a, a lot of interest in the fish in the mystic. And I'll show you, this is a 3D model of an adult-sized river herring. There is a group of scientists at a lab at UMass Amherst who has been studying the fish. They've been studying the fish at Mystic Lakes and they provided us with the 3D model. So that's about the size of an alewife. Bluebacks are sort of not as bulky, they're a little bit longer. They tend to migrate a little bit later, but they're so similar that they're lumped together from a scientific perspective into, into the group of river herring. So they're about this big when they swim up. So they lay all their eggs. The eggs hatch out, well, I guess I should say that the adult fish then turn around and go back to the ocean. They don't hang around a lot, but uh, the eggs hatch depending on temperature in a couple of weeks. And that's about the size, so here's my fingers to give you an idea, of a river herring fish fry after it's hatched. No, oh, I'd say this is about two weeks old. I, just to give you a sense of size. So, so many fish in that system, those fish that hatch out are eating zooplankton or small invertebrates that are in the water, like I tried to show you before. Um, and they are growing. So. By the end of the summer, the fish in Mystic Lakes are about this big, maybe not quite, um, and that is about the size they are when they turn around and head back to the ocean. So all summer they're in our freshwater systems, and then they head out to the ocean where they live for about five years until they're sexually mature, and then in the spring they'll come back. So Unlike salmon who have to lay eggs in fresh water like uh, river herring do, the alewives um, don't die. Salmon lay eggs and die. The river herring return to the ocean, which is where they live most of their lives, and they come back every spring. And so that's sort of their life cycle. Um, all right. So I said I had a couple of things to talk about, but I think I'm gonna come back to that. Let me, let me go through my story and then I'll show you things at the end because it might make more sense. Uh, where is, there. Oh my goodness, just when you think you have it all, I can't expand this. There it is, okay, slideshow. Uh, 
Okay, so Mystic River is a really urban river. It's not very long. It's actual, the actual river is seven miles long, which as rivers go, isn't very long. Um, this is a view from Medford and you can see the buildings of Boston in the background. Um, it, although it's not very big and the watershed itself is not huge either, there, it's home to an amazing amount of nature and also an awful lot of built infrastructure. We're a very urban watershed. Half a million people live within our watershed. It's the most densely populated watershed in uh, Massachusetts. So for a lot of reasons, this is an interesting story, not so much about who eats what, but about how human impact and wildlife can end up being in harmony, sort of. Um, Anyway, so here's a picture of the river near where it enters Boston Harbor. And as you can see, it's a really urban area. Um, so much human infrastructure, it's hard to see where the river is. Um, probably as you know, people are very smart animals, but we're also incredibly messy. We're able to make so many things for us, but the things that we make for us often impacts the environmental quality for other life. So to think about this as a migration pathway for 700,000 plus fish, um, that's kind of an amazing story because there's so much opportunity for pollutants and for um, ecological degra degradation. I'm sorry, that's mispronounced. Um, that it is a remarkable story that the herring run on the Mystic is so big. So there are the river herring. They're a schooling fish, so they travel together um, in groups. And again, they provide so much energy to our watershed system. This is a map. So they're coming from Boston Harbor. They live basically most of their lives out in the Atlantic Ocean. Not a whole lot is known about their lives there. Um, but in the springtime, they migrate to lay their eggs. So they'll come in Boston Harbor, swim up the Mystic River, um, and make their way to the Mystic Lakes and beyond. Now, you might notice on this map, there are a couple of barriers, and that's kind of an important um, thought because it really is barriers to the migration has led to sort of a decline, a big decline in uh, fish populations. If the fish can't get access to the river because dams are in the way, or if the fish can't use the river water effectively because it's polluted, those are two reasons why populations were dropping. Um, and so there was a historical drop in numbers of river herring um, when dams were beginning to be built and also as we saw water quality decline. This was a really important fish historically. And then, as I said, populations dropped. Well, the good news is the water's cleaner, much cleaner. In fact, the Mystic River has really good water quality in the main stem of the river almost all the time. So pollution is no longer an issue for the river herring, but access historically has been. So this is picture of the Mystic Lakes. The lower Mystic Lake is on my left and the upper Mystic Lake is on the right. Those two lakes are separated by a dam and the dam was a problem the fish could not get past for many, many years. Um, in 2011, a fish ladder was installed to provide access. So that was great news for the river herring and we have also been able to monitor populations starting then. So um, you can see sort of an incline on the cement part. The fish ladder is encased sort of in that cement, and so the fish are able to have access to more breeding ground, um, which is really an awesome story for the fish, and it's also fantastic for all the other organisms that rely on the fish. So the dam was built in 1863, I believe, so it's not a new dam at all. And it was originally built to control water flow in the upper Mystic Lake. At one point in time, the Mystic Lake was used as a water supply, drinking water supply source for Boston area. That didn't last long, but the dam was put in and there was a lake that was existing, but much deeper and also has controlled water in a way it didn't necessarily have before. Anyway. 
So if you're a fish and you're at the lower part of this dam without getting out of the water and walking around, there's no way to get to Upper Mystic Lake, which is prime habitat for the alewives and bluebacks to lay their eggs. The Upper Mystic Lake is deeper, there's more water, and also if you can get to the Upper Mystic Lake, you can also make your way further on up the system through the Abajona River to Center Falls, where there is in Winchester Center, and there's another fish ladder there. And beyond that, all the way to Horn Pond, which is another big piece of habitat prime for laying eggs. So the fish are able to have access there as well. So before the fish ladder was built, people worked together to help some fish, not a lot, but some fish get from Lower Mystic Lake to Upper Mystic Lake using a um, bucket brigade. So this is a picture of a bucket brigade happening at Mystic Lake. Um, I'm not sure when this was taken. I would say maybe uh, late 70s, early 80s maybe beyond that, but that was one way to help the fish get over. They could return to the ocean going down the spillway, but they couldn't swim up into the um, Mystic Lake, the upper Mystic Lake over the spillway. So anyway, fish ladder. I just thought you might be interested in what it looks like. Our fish ladder at Upper Mystic Lakes is made out of wood. Um, river herring are really strong, fast swimmers, but they don't jump well. Salmon are jumpers, they can jump over things in a way river salmon, I mean, excuse me, river herring can't. So this fish ladder was constructed to provide sort of like steps and also resting pools so that the fish could make their way up, take a rest, swim a little more, take a rest. Um, when the water is running, it is rushing through. So strong, it's amazing the fish can make it up there. So um, how do we know how many fish there are? Um, we have a video camera that was installed in April this year, every year we, we install it. This is Ben Gahagan. He's the fish biologist for Massachusetts. Um, so he is studying the fish. He's a specialist in river herring and other migrating species. Uh, so there he is putting in the video camera. So that's how we're keeping count. I'm hoping that you will um, help us count fish because we certainly need that help. Um, using the video camera and I'll show you a little bit more about that. Okay, so river herring come through the fish ladder. There they are at the end. And here is a picture of the Horn Pond Fishway. So it's not an official fish ladder, although there will be one going in and the fish are able to swim up over the rocks to get to Horn Pond. Um, and you look closely and there's a picture of a fish at that Horn Pond spillway last week. Um, all right, so the fish are there. The f we're paying attention to the fish. Scientists are very interested in the fish, but the fish are also bringing so many other animals. So here at uh, Horn Pond at the dam, um, the fishway is right in front of us. Great blue heron is hanging out, just getting ready to have a fish dinner. So everything eats something. Herons in particular are great fish eaters. Blue herons, enormous birds. I hope people have seen them before. They're, they look prehistoric to me. They're amazing. So they're one of the many birds that are there because the fish are there. Um, pretty cool to see. Other birds that also are eating the fish, um, there's a cormorant, the dark bird that has a fish in its mouth, hang out around when the fish are running, when the herring are in the river, just waiting for a river herring dinner. Um, they eat other birds, I mean, excuse me, they eat other fish as well. And the picture with the tree in it, you might be able to see the outline of black crowned night herons hanging out in the tree. That's another type of heron, the great blue heron and black crowned night heron, um, who are certainly around, that's their call, when the fish are running. Um, the day that I took this picture, this was last year, there were four in the tree, you can't see the other two, and there were maybe five or six other night herons just around the edge fishing for fish. 
it's, for me, it's amazing to see. I really enjoy watching the birds looking for dinner. So we also see bald eagle in the mystic. Um, they're fish eaters too. So it's not unusual to see a, a bald eagle fly over. I have yet to see one grab up fish, but I've seen pictures that other people have showed me that um, they saw the eagles grab the fish, um, which is great. So we have some other fish that um, also eat the river herring, uh, the night herons I already told you about, um, herring gulls. So herring gulls are um, seagulls, I guess I would say, but they're specifically herring gulls. And as many animals do, they have a name that tells you something about their behavior. So if you're a herring gull, um, one of the things you'd like to eat is going to be herring. So um, they hang out and grab up river herring often as it's coming out of the spillway. I think, you know, the circle of life is cruel in many ways, but there are an abundance of river herring and river herring is a prey species. Many species eat the river herring. And um, so that's how it goes. Everything has to eat something. Um, another unusual bird is a grackle that also eats um, river herring. And grackles are small birds, much smaller birds, um, that take herring that have not made it. So it's an, there are a lot of fish, some fish die, they don't make it all the way up or all the way back. And there are birds and other animals that eat the fish that are dead. And um, the grackles are one of those fish. So. Those are adult stories, adult fish stories, but when they hatch out and there's so many fish fry in the system, there are millions of fish swimming around, which provides food for other animals that maybe are not, that aren't as big as great blue heron. They're not as big as eagles, something that would have to eat something smaller. So the smaller fish are food for an abundance of animals. Um, so many, uh, turtles, frogs, um, let's see, what else was I going to say? Oh, so many smaller things. Sometimes raccoons will be fishing. They could catch a relatively small fish on the edge. Mink, otter would eat, probably not the small ones, but the bigger ones. So there's incredible circle of life. I want to show you these American eel, which also eat river herring. Um, these are young eel, and eel have kind of an unusual life cycle too. They have to have fresh water and salt water in order to be able to live. Um, river herring is something they eat, so that's a good thing. The American eel are born in salt water. They have to hatch out of eggs in salt water and they spend most of their life in fresh water or brackish water. These were from the upper Mystic Lake coming through the, uh, the eel way there. So they were making their way from the ocean to the Mystic Lakes to live their lives. And there's plenty of food when they get there. Um, so I said a lot of scientists are interested in the river herring run in the mystic. Um, and not only do birds and mammals and amphibians eat river herring, but a lot of fish also are using river herring as a food source. So this group of scientists from Rockefeller University came last year, took DNA samples of the water there at the Mystic Lakes, and they identified these 17 different species that were there. Um, some because of river herring migration, they would have followed the, the herring up the river. Uh, largemouth bass, striped bass, bass are all fish that eat the river herring and would have followed them up. In the ocean, uh, there are many fish that people depend on that also eat the river herring in the ocean or in the Boston Harbor. Cod, haddock, um, bluefish, striped bass, all of those fish eat the river herring. So they are really important species to us as well as to the ecosystem in general. 
So scientists, again, are studying and these a group of scientists from UMass Amherst were studying what the fish eat in the river. I mean, in, I'm sorry, in the lakes. So they were gathering samples to look for what feeds the fish. The fish eat zooplankton, which are small animals, like I showed you before, in the water. Um, rotifers, which is the long skinny one, Daphnia is the plumper one, are two things that are found in abundance um, in freshwater systems, the Mystic Lakes and also. Um, the bottom of the lakes are kind of sandy rocky. And when I sampled, I found Daphnia and um, Oh my gosh, I've forgotten the name of that one. That's very silly. Uh, and also in the samples, I found a water mite, uh, a side swimmer, an aquatic worm, flatworm, and also I picked up some freshwater clams, but I put a water mussel because that's a really interesting story about river herring. So I'm gonna get out of this in a minute. This is a video I hope I can show you. This is a side swimmer. I, just in the water that lives amongst the rocks is very small, less than an inch big. And let's see if we can see it swimming. So fish food for sure. Um, this one on the right, there's a tiny water mite that maybe you can see moving. There were hundreds of those in the small sample that I looked at. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Again, has to be good habitat for the fish or the fish wouldn't be there. So I think I'm at the end. Um, let me get out of this. I'm gonna stop my screen share. Um, and I am running out of time, but I wanted to show you this. So I talked about freshwater mussels. So there are clams and mussels that are in fresh water. Um, and there are mussels, particularly the Eastern pond mussel, that rely on the river herring for their life cycle. So the larva, the small babies of the uh, pond mussel, have an interesting life cycle, so do the river herring, but the pond mussel has to attach itself to a fish gill. And it turns out that river herring are the gills they like to attach themselves to. So out floating in the water are the river herring larva that the fish breathe in and get stuck in their um, gills. The fish swim up to fresh water um, and the mussels at some point dislodge and grow in the system, which is pretty amazing, like totally amazing. They're also uh, an endangered species, which I thought was interesting. Um, river herring are a protected species in Massachusetts. Um, the pond mussel is a protected or an endangered species. So there's a connection. The pond mussel has to have the river herring in order to complete its life cycle. I wanted to show you that uh, something that eats mussels and freshwater clams. So I found these freshwater clam shells right in, in the Mystic Lakes. I didn't see a mussel shell, although our water quality scientist Andy has found some. So there's an animal that's in the system. We see it all the time. Uh, and maybe you've seen it too, muskrat. Muskrats are herbivores. Well, not total herbivores, they're omnivores. They eat plants, particularly the plant stalks and the plant um, roots in aquatic systems but they also eat mussels and freshwater clams. And that's one sign of um, uh, the muskrat is if you find a cache or a bunch of shells just left sort of together, you could say, well, that's a sign of muskrat because they eat so many. So the pond mussel relies on the river herring and the gills and the muskrat also is a consumer of uh, freshwater clams and mussels. And so there's this connection in that way. Um, let's see, I guess since I've been going and going and going, I should probably end here other than to say that, um, and I'll take some questions if there are any, say that 
we really rely on citizen scientists to help us keep count of the river herring. The river herring are super important to our ecosystem. There are connections um, throughout our ecosystem to um, uh, the river herring. They provide so much energy and also even for people to just watch the herring come through. If you're not a fish person, then there's the birds to pay attention to. If you're not a bird person, there's the aquatic invertebrates to pay attention to. If that's not you ringing your bell, there are um, amphibians and also uh, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking out how, how crazy. Otters, mink, and other animals to keep an eye on. So, uh, I guess I'll go to questions. Erica, do we have any? All right, we had one question about um, can people fish for herring? So you actually touched on them being a threatened species. Yeah, they're in yep. Massachusetts, they are species. So even though the numbers have recovered, there was a point where the numbers were so low that the state of Massachusetts banned fishing, harvesting, they're calling it, a river herring. It used to be when the populations were so high, people could scoop up the river herring right out of the rivers um, with nets. And actually, they were used for a lot of different things, including fertilizing um, farmland and also baiting lobster traps. So for a lot of reasons, they were important, but they're now protected because their population had dropped so extreme. Um, now that's a little less true, but because they're an important um, species for things that we eat, like the bluefish, cod, tuna, other fish, um, they are still listed as protected. So right here, in our own like urban watershed, river herring are protected, um, bald eagle are seen and are protected, American eel are protected, um, the pond mussel is endangered. We think of these things as exotic, but here they are right in our own backyard. Awesome, let's see. I don't think I we have any other questions. Okay, well, uh, so I could say a closing word then. Great, perfect. Okay, so um, this was kind of a quick caring tour and everything eats something kind of tour, but I was going to encourage you to go out and look and see the connections there are right in your own neighborhood. Um, see what's eating what. Plants are being eaten by insects. Insects are being eaten by birds or other animals. All of those are happening right in front of our eyes. Um, if you know that's happening, if you understand that ecological connection, and if you value it, that's awesome. Share it with other people. If you get down to a river, any river, but we're partial to the mystic, keep your eyes open, especially in the spring. There's life in there that's invisible unless you take a stop, you stop and take a look. So I guess that's it for me. Thanks, awesome. everyone. Well, great. Thank you, Marion. That was really interesting. All right. So I just put in the chat box, the Mystic Herring website. So Marion mentioned that's where you can go online and help us count the river herring uh, with our underwater fish cam. And we've seen several days in a row now of over 20,000 fish going up the fish ladder a day. So um, they are here and we definitely can use your help um, getting an estimate of the, the migration. Also, we usually celebrate the river herring migration every year with a big event, a 5K and paddle race with educational opportunities. This year, since we can't gather in person, we're not going to do that. But I'm putting another virtual event in the chat box. And so this is a virtual walk and run um, where you can also help us celebrate by participating and sharing information about the herring. Um, this link provides all the details and I hope you'll join us. All right, Thanks. take care everyone. Bye-bye.